tonight on All In. We saw one of the shooters, he had a brown jacket on. They were really young. Somebody just acting out of, out of control. A Super Bowl celebration ends in mass gun violence. Parades, rallies, schools, movies. It seems like almost nothing is safe. What we know about what happened in Kansas City. Then Jack Smith asked the Supreme Court to hurry up. Tonight's filing from the special counsel to try and end Trump delay tactics. And as George Santos taunts the MAGA Congress that ejected him, new signs Republicans aren't learning lessons from their losing ways. Stop running around for Trump and start running the country. But All In starts right now. Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. There's a lot of news to get to tonight, including a rocket of a filing from Special Prosecutor Jack Smith, the results of that special congressional race in New York. But we begin tonight with the devastating and depressingly familiar news from Missouri. There, a shooting at the end of the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl victory parade has left at least one person dead, about two dozen in the crowd wounded, according to police. Nine of those who suffered gunshot wounds were children, ranging in ages from 6 to 15, according to hospital officials. Now, when the Chiefs won the title on Sunday, a record number of people watched the game, and by all accounts, a record number of fans, hundreds of thousands, turned out in downtown Kansas City for today's celebration. It was as that celebration was ending this afternoon that the shooting began. In this reporter's live shot, you can see people in the background running for their lives. Three people are now in police custody, although I have to say it's unclear exactly what the motive was or why any of this happened. But officials did say they do not believe the motive of the shooting was terrorism. This all happened on a day meant to celebrate the back-to-back -back Super Bowl victories of the Chiefs, a high point, of course, for community pride in Kansas City and the greater metro area there, a place that absolutely loves this dynastic team. Witnesses report there were plenty of people helping their neighbors through the turmoil. Professional football players comforting scared kids, fans in jerseys pulling strangers out of danger, administering first aid. But it also happened in Missouri, a Republican-dominated state where lawmakers have rolled back gun restrictions for decades, leaving the state with some of the weakest gun laws in the nation, something the mayor alluded to just a couple hours ago. I mean, that's, that's what happens with guns. I won't get in a big debate right now. I think we're still doing an investigation. But, I mean, what you saw happen was why people talk about guns a lot. We had over 800 officers there, staffed, situated all around Union Station today. We had security in, in any number of places, eyes on top of buildings and beyond. And there still is a risk to people. And I think that's something that all of us who are, are parents, who are just regular people living each day, have to decide what we wish to do about it. Jason Kander served as Secretary of State from, for Missouri from 2013 to 2017. He's also on the board of the Gifford Center to Prevent Gun Violence. He's from Kansas City, a veteran of the Afghanistan war, and he joins me tonight. Um, Jason, it's great to have you on. Um, I'm sorry it's under these circumstances. First, just how are folks there? How are you processing this awful mix uh, of, of joy and celebration and civic pride ending on this horrible note? Yeah, um, heartbreaking is not enough. Um, you know, probably like a lot of people watching right now, it's stunning when you actually stop as an American and think about how many people you know personally have either been the victims of or at least at the scene of mass shootings. And for me, it's quite a few. Uh, and that's before today. Uh, and this is not that big of a town. I promise you. In fact, I've already sadly heard from some people um, that the, for me, this list is, it's going to be bigger. And, and I think that's just increasingly true for so many people watching right now. You're someone who, um, you served in Afghanistan. You had a, a sort of iconic ad, uh, in which you assembled an assault rifle blindfolded or not looking, uh, at, at the weapon, um, but then talked about your views on weapons. You're on the board of, of Giffords. Missouri is a state that's been you know, almost a leader, a forefront, I would say, uh, in the kind of, you know, gun absolutist movement. Um, do you think today changes that at all? 
Probably not, um, sadly. But I think that that has more to do with the way that this debate has been framed in this country. It's been very successfully framed by gun manufacturers. As it's been falsely framed. It's been framed as a debate. And look, we don't know what weapon was used. We don't know motive. We don't know any of that stuff. I'm not talking about today. I'm on because today happened and I'm just pissed off. <laughs> um, and, and so I want to talk about this. I want to talk about the fact that they frame this debate as people like me who believe in gun safety versus people who own guns. But I also own a gun. And I don't think that's what's really going on in this country. I think this is between Americans and greedy corporations. They always talk about the Second Amendment, but nobody ever talks about the fact that in 2005, they passed a law that infringes on the Seventh Amendment, which nobody ever hears about. The Seventh Amendment is the amendment to the U.S. Constitution that says, if you have in controversy in any matter more than $20, you have a right to a civil jury trial. Well, in 2005, we passed this law. George W. Bush signed it. It's called PLACA. It's the, uh, what? something Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms. It's just a fancy way of saying that they gave the gun industry the kind of immunity that nobody who makes literally any other product in this country gets. You know how there's like less smoking than there was so many years ago? It's not because of Congress. It's because of lawsuits. That's right. the reason my car and your car doesn't flip over on the road, because of lawsuits. That's why truckers have to get a certain amount of sleep before they get on the road. Congress didn't do that stuff. Lawsuits did that stuff, and everybody likes to demonize them. But when 12 reasonable people can come together, called a jury, and make a decision about what's reasonable in their community, oftentimes they're going to decide, as they started to in the 90s, that gun companies actually can foresee a lot of damage being done and that they can look into who's buying these guns. Now, gun companies, by the way, have uh, they, they have the ability to make guns smart guns. Most illegal gun crime happens with stolen guns. If smart gun technology were out there, which is never going to get mandated by Congress, you wouldn't have this happen. But if you just, you don't have to change a bunch of laws. If you just remove literally like the dumbest law we have on the books, the gun industry is going to police itself. They're going to be begging us to police them because of the liability they're going to have. So that's what I think about in addition to the people in my community who have been hurt. But this is the governmental side of what I think about on a day like today. It makes me very angry. Yeah, I mean, thinking, thinking about this, when I've seen these images, right, of course, um, you know, the, the danger of just this object, right, and, and it being out there. I and mean, there's all sorts of ways, all sorts of things. There's all the security, there's safety. You got police officers, you got areas taped off. You don't want cars going there, right? There's all sorts of ways in which the space is protected and regulated. And yet this this one device, which is a particularly deadly and dangerous device, and we have more of them in our country than anywhere else, is going to end up at a scene like that, as we're seeing now. And the aftermath of it will be predictable. And we have to find some way of attacking that. And I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. What they do is they they try and overwhelm us with the difficulty of the problem. They mm. say over and over again, like on assault weapons, they say, well, how are you going to define what an assault weapon is? Which is a stupid question, but let's pretend it's not for a second, right? Or they'll say, uh, well, how are you going to, you know, they'll say, uh, well, this crime or that crime was committed with a gun that was already illegal. It was illegal for them to have a gun. Oh, and then you say, well, should we perhaps pass smart gun technology and require it? They say, well, how are you going to define that? Well, the answer is, you just let juries do it over and over and over again. And pretty soon, the gun companies, here's what they're going to do. I promise you, not only are they going to do all these things on their own to avoid losing their butt in court all the time, they're going to end up making a ton of money because they'll start gun insurance, side companies, subsidiaries. And then you know what you'll have? You'll have a registry of guns because they can't create a need for gun insurance hmm. if they don't know everybody who owns their guns. So they're going to make plenty of money if we do it the other way. They don't want to do anything difficult. So all we got to do is get rid of one stupid law and a whole lot of the things that we need in order to keep people safe in this country are going to happen. Jason Kander, uh, a proud son of Kansas City, uh, and great to have you on. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances. Great to see you, though, sir. Thanks, Chris. Up next, uh, another story that broke in the last couple of hours, Special Counsel Jack Smith didn't wait at all until the deadline to file his response to the latest Trump immunity tactic. He is insisting the Supreme Court acts without delay. Full details ahead. 
Tonight, just a couple hours ago, special counsel Jack Smith filed a response to Donald Trump's request for absolute immunity in the case to steal the 2020 election. You will remember a D.C. Court of Appeals panel unanimously rejected Trump's claim of immunity in a powerful ruling last week. On Monday, the ex-president asked the Supreme Court to stay that ruling, part of his attempt to keep delaying a trial. And a couple of hours ago, Jack Smith responded. Now, the Supreme Court had given Smith a week to respond. He did it in a day, showing his sense of urgency in resolving this as fast as possible so that Trump can face trial before the November election. He writes... The stay should be denied because of applicants' failure to meet this court's settled standards. The charged crimes strike at the heart of our democracy. Our president's alleged criminal scheme to overturn an election and thwart the peaceful transfer of power to a successor should be the last place to recognize a novel form of absolute immunity from federal criminal law. He continues that Trump's interlocutory appeal, that is, his appeal before the trial even happens, already, quote, placed the district court proceedings on hold, thus delaying the trial and verdict in this case. He has no entitlement to a further stay while seeking discretionary review from this court. Delay in the resolution of these charges threatens to frustrate the public interest in a speedy and fair verdict, a compelling interest in every criminal case and one that has unique national importance here as it involves federal criminal charges against a former president for alleged criminal efforts to overturn the results of the presidential election, including through the use of official power. Joining me now is Harry Lippman. He's a former U.S. attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania, a former deputy assistant attorney general at the Department of Justice. He also clerked for two previous Supreme Court justices, Thurgood Marshall and Anthony Kennedy. Um, Harry, I don't think you or I are surprised this turned around this fast because Smith has been keenly aware of the pacing. What do you make of the filing? Well, the speed of it, uh, Chris, as you say, really communicates urgency, need for speed. There's also a kind of a swashbuckling quality, at least within the culture of Supreme Court. Look what I can do. I only need a day. Boom, there it is. You, you try to top that Trump. So basically, he's making two arguments here. He's saying, look, you're not, you're not likely to succeed on the merits here because the law is against you, as been found at the district court and in the unanimous opinion below. And here's why the law is against him. And there's a huge public interest here to move on this. But if you're going to grant it, he says, we believe it, if you believe it merits review, the government respectfully requests it treat the application as a petition for a writ of certiorari, grant the petition, set the case for expedited briefing and argument. The government proposes a schedule that permit argument in March 2024, consistent with the court's expedition of other cases meriting such treatment. What's that mean? OK, let me take that in two parts, please. The first is, and the all-important fact here, is that it, they're trying. Trump needs a stay. And that means, for starters, five votes, not four. And if he doesn't get it, it doesn't matter if the court continues to review the claim. Right. The Mandate goes back to Chutkin. For starters, he needs five votes. That's the first point about the stay. The second point about the stay is there are established standards for having it. It's not, they, they argue the merits, as you say, but within the context of a heightened showing Trump must make. First, he's got a fair probability of success. He's likely to win the immunity claim. They say no way, no how for all the reasons that immunity would fail. And then balance of equities, where they talk about speed and come as close as they have to tiptoeing to the line and saying, guys, look at this. You know, we need to do <laughs> yes. this by November. So that's the first part and the most important part. Remember, stay rule of five. He's got to make these showings. The court has to believe he's likely to succeed. And he isn't, by the way. Very few people think he'll win on the merits. Your second point, yes, they're saying if you really want to take it, and I think at the end of the day, they'll take it if they want. They won't if they don't. It won't be really because of what Smith says. Do it super quick as you can. Take that motion for a stay and turn it into a petition for cert. They do that sometimes increasingly uh, in the last few years. And let's get it on and have this by March. And then if they do, probably they would have an opinion, say, by 
early May. Now, then you, you have to add the big chunk of time that's been lost so far. But um, I think that still makes it tenable, but it gets really close. The most important point is the argument for a stay and justices having to find that in order to grant a stay, that he's likely to prevail on the merits. I think that's a hard argument for them to prevail on. And so, just so I'm clear on this, I'm a little clear about yeah. the difference between... It makes a big difference whether you need five votes or four. You need four to grant cert, you need five for a stay, and they're saying... They haven't actually petitioned for cert. They've just asked for a stay here. They're saying, if you're going to grant the stay, treat it as cert. But it still needs five votes, right? The, the bar still... They still got to round up five votes. 100%, and it really matters. The, I, I worked on a case where there were four votes to grant, but not the fifth for a stay, and it was a death penalty case. He was executed. I right. don't think uh, Roberts will want that to happen. It's not just that you need five, that's for starters, but you need to make a different showing. You need to show your that Trump needs to show he's likely to win. I don't think they, that he is likely to win, and so we'll see if the you know if the court gets contentious about that. But that's what really matters, and also the balance of equities, meaning we have to get to this case. It's super important. So that factors into a stay. It would be very different if it were on the merits for cert, where they would just argue straight right. up or down. Last thing quickly. So one yeah. of the things, he's so keenly aware of the clock and the math, which is something where it seems everyone else seems a little like, he's like, we got it. He's like, the clock starts and then it's 88 days. He says, this, this case got paused with 88 days to trial. So whenever we, we unpause it, it's 88 days. And he's basically, you said, tiptoeing up to the line to be like, this has to happen very soon. Exactly right. You know, Trump will have a due process right to go through what he was going to go through anyway, but then it'll be before Chutkin. And he's really making it clear. Uh, and court, we need this. We need this now. This has been true from the start. When you and I first talked about the bringing of the case, it was built for speed. He's had his focus on this from the start. And again, Move, opposing the stay. Remember, they moved for cert before, but now they're they're saying, don't take the case. Right. DC Circuit is perfectly fine. All right, Harry Lippman, that was very, very illuminating. Thank you so much, Thank as you. always. Still ahead, ousted Congressman George Santos gets the last laugh after Democrats flip his former seat. But the latest Democratic win shows about the Republican detachment from reality. Next. We've got the results of the first special election of 2024, and it was a huge loss for Republicans. In New York's 3rd Congressional District, Democrat Tom Suozzi defeated Republican Mozzie Pillup by nearly eight points. Suozzi will now replace the expelled, criminally indicted former Congressman George Santos, bringing Republicans' already tight majority in the House down to just six seats. Now, you might think, the day after, that the party would be wondering where they went wrong after such a crushing loss in what was supposed to be a neck-and-neck -neck tight race. George Santos won this same district by nearly eight points just over a year ago. Instead, Republicans are defiant in their defeat. The chair of the New York Republican Party, Ed Cox, released a statement saying in part, quote, Republicans will win this scene in November when the campaign resets to focus on Joe Biden and Democrats' disastrous open borders, soft on crime policies, rather than the specific circumstances that brought about this election. And I got to say to me, this statement perfectly defines the difference between the two major parties. Republicans approach each election with a kind of unbridled, undeserved confidence. They believe the voters are with them. They think they represent real Americans and therefore the real majority of the country. According to Republicans, Democrats are the party of the out-of-touch elite, the freaks, minorities. So Republicans should not have to think about whether their message is working or whether they are running good candidates. It is simply their destiny. It is their fate to be voted into power. But of course, what we keep seeing over and over in 2020, 2022, and now 2024, is that the majority of Americans do not like the candidates Republicans are running or the messages they are pushing. And the party refuses to learn that lesson in election after election. They run unlikable candidates on ridiculous issues and they lose. Mozzie Pillow was a soldier who fought terrorism, who supports stronger borders and lower taxes. Tom Swazi opened the border. Tom Swazi 
funding the sanctuary city. We will wage a war on the woke. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. I'm Dave White, and I'll never let CRT be taught in our classrooms. There's nothing racist about stopping critical race theory. we got to get this transgender ideology out of our schools. My senior year, I was forced to compete against a biological male. That's unfair and wrong. Which one of you is from the New York Times? You know there's only two genders, right? Every one of those candidates lost. But the Republican Party didn't learn from Curry Lake and trans swimmers or Josh Mandel and CRT or Ron DeSantis and the war on woke. They won't learn from Mozzie Pillup and crime in the border either. Imagine, though, for a moment, if the shoe were on the other foot. I mean, it was totally possible, right, that we'd wake up this morning and the Democrat had lost this race in New York. And just imagine, imagine the amount of second-guessing that would be circulating in the party, in progressive and center-left circles, in the mainstream press, on the op-ed pages of the New York Times. It would be constant. Because the Democratic Party and the larger coalition is in a near-constant state of anxiety. They're always worried that their coalition will crack, that they will lose the support of real Americans. I think part of that is, is because the party apparatus is, in fact, dominated by college-educated people living in big metro areas, big cities, who make up a disproportionate number of campaign, political staffers, actual elected officials, and the media. And especially since 2016, that group of folks really does fear they're missing something, something key about what voters not in those circles think. Now, that fear that they're missing something can be pretty neurotic and debilitating. It's the source of, like, the, you know, hundreds of diner safari pieces we've all read. But I will say this. I think it's also an important, helpful effect. The whole point of politics and elections is to win the support of a majority of people. So if you're always worried about losing them, you have to really engage with what the voters think and feel, how to reach them. It does, I think, keep the Democratic Party tethered to reality, while Republicans increasingly are just about the opposite of that. They are so convinced of their own virtue, they've completely lost sight of the fact that on a lot of topics, they're the ones that actually sound like freaks and weirdos. They are so certain they are the real Americans, they cannot see how far they are from them. Here's a perfect example. Republicans, about how lost Republicans are. The conservative uproar about Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. Somehow, Republicans are threatened by the image of the towering, square-jawed, conventionally handsome star athlete kissing his blonde, red-lipped, conventionally attractive pop star girlfriend. He's from Ohio, plays for Kansas City. She got her start in Nashville with country music. She's Miss Americana, and he's the heartbreak prince. It's like a 1950s James Dean daydream. They are quintessentially middle America, conservative-coded as it gets. And Republicans have so alienated themselves from actual middle America that this is a threat to them now? They can't hear it, though. They cannot learn from it. They cannot course correct. They keep attacking America's prom king and queen. They plan to run Mozzie Pillip again in New York's 3rd District in November, and she'll run on the same issues. And they still support Donald Trump. Because when you believe that you never have to listen to what the voters are telling you, you can pretend that you won an election that you lost by 7 million votes. Michelle Goldberg is an opinion columnist for The New York Times, and she joins me now. Michelle, you and I, you've written about this. You, you and I have talked about it so much. I was just so amazed by the Republican Party putting out this statement last night after they got their butts kicked. Like, they really thought they had a shot. It was supposed to be neck and neck. Like, they lost badly. Being like, we're just going to do this again. <laughs> we're going to run this exact same race in nine months. And if the shoe were on the other foot, you, know, you and I know Democrats would be, we'd have 100 op-eds this morning about... Tom Suozzi was too woke. Mm -hmm. Well, so I actually want to say that there is one reason why, I, look, I don't think it's going to go any different in November, but I do think that there is something specific about special elections yes. that favor this Democratic coalition. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that um, the Republican candidate lost here. She was, you know, they had, the, the, this, the district had just kind of been humiliated by the George Santos debacle. Along comes this untested person who is not a kind of George Santos level fraud, but had been a little bit misleading about some elements of her background, you know, hadn't really been a paratrooper, even though she said she was a paratrooper, um, was a Democrat, wouldn't say whether or not she voted for Donald Trump, wouldn't kind of, wasn't straightforward about her position on abortion. And 
So at the same time, you know, this is the Republican Party has exchanged basically middle class, college educated suburbanites for downscale voters. And in some way, in general elections, that can be a decent trade because yep. there are just a lot more non-college educated voters than college educated voters. But what it means is that a lot of the most conscientious voters, the people who vote in every election, who vote in special elections, who vote in off-year elections, um, who vote early, those people are now kind of the most reliable, are now an incre increasingly reliable part of the Democratic base. So, you know, you also saw this in a state house election in Pennsylvania yesterday, in um, in in the suburbs of you know, kind of purple suburb where the Democrat just won overwhelmingly. Yeah, and I, I think, but I do think okay, so that's true about special elections, but it connects to one of the points here, which I think is important, which is candidate quality, which I do think mm -hmm. is a huge. I they don't. They're not recruiting good candidates routinely. And I think there's a real breakdown there because I do think they're a little less worried about this stuff. Now, with her, it's like, oh, she has this amazing bio, and she does, right? She's an immigrant herself. She's originally from Ethiopia. She's Israeli. She's served in the IDF. She's Orthodox. She, I mean, it is a very compelling story, no doubt. But she was a bad candidate, and they keep running a string of bad candidates, and no one seems... It doesn't seem like they're having, like, an internal discussion the like, what are we doing wrong question. It, it's amazing how unasked that is in that universe. Well, right, and I think what you're seeing in the House is kind of all the quote unquote normal Republicans, people who seem to take governing seriously. There's just an exodus of them. Yeah, they're retiring. Seeing, right, you're also seeing all around the country, I mean, I'm in Michigan right now, but you're seeing all around the country Republican parties kind of collapsing, being either taken over by incompetent weirdos, um, how, you know, kind of in crazy infighting, real fundraising problems, just real sort of management challenges, because, you know, the Trumpist part of the party is not really interested in governing. They're, they don't have a talent for administration. They can be good at being inflammatory and kind of driving certain cable news cycles. But they're just, you know, they just, they're not good at the nuts and bolts yeah. of politics. And so the Republican Party's in a bind because, you know, the people who are attracted to Trump sort of aren't there when he's not around. But so many other people who used to be Republicans are repelled by what the Republican Party has become. Yeah, Michigan's got a, a very funny uh, a two popes <laughs> situation at Avignon Pope Papacy, where two people are claiming to be the Michigan chair. Uh, today, one of them was defeated by the other one, although whether she takes a hint, we don't know. But what do you think about this idea? I, I go back and forth on this. What do you think about the idea of, like, the kind of post-2016, particularly liberal neuroses anxiety that we're out of touch, we're out of touch, we're out of touch, we're losing people, does have some adaptive qualities, that it isn't totally insidious, and that that, that that insecurity can be really malign and pathological in all kinds of ways that I find, like, really taxing, but also at least does force people in the coalition to constantly be trying to check back with where voters are at. Right. And, and you kind of will never hear mainstream Democrats just outwardly malign huge parts of the country the way that you hear Republicans speak with absolute contempt about New York, New York, right. California, the coasts, big cities. And it's because, you, right, Democrats are very, very concerned by losing by less, even in the places where they where they're not able to win. And, but it also goes to, I mean, I think it, it definitely goes to what you said earlier about Republicans believe that they represent, quote unquote, the people and the people who don't vote for them are in some sense not real Americans anyway, and so don't necessarily deserve representation. But I think it also has to do with, not, not necessarily in the House, but the structure of our politics, where Republicans just don't need to win as many people in order to maintain power. And they don't need to win a majority in many cases in order to maintain power. And their coalition is much more homogenous. And so they just yes, you know, so, that's, so they kind of don't need to worry as much about it, about building a that's coalition. That's right. They're, they're, they've somehow gotten gotten through without, without it. Michelle Goldberg, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Still to come, the good news about what immigration means for America and what Democrats need to do to capitalize on it. Next. The Congressional Budget Office, also known as the CBO, is a nonpartisan uh, congressional agency. 
which has provided economic and budget data to Congress since the 1970s. Earlier this month, it released its economic forecast for the next 10 years, which included a really fascinating bit of information that I think has gone undercovered regarding immigration. So the report effectively says the GDP, the, the growth of all of our economy, everything that we do, is going to be boosted by $7 trillion more over the next 10 years due to immigration. What's more, the federal government will raise an additional $1 trillion in revenue thanks to high immigration rates. That means that a trillion dollars will go into government coffers in the form of taxes paid that wouldn't have otherwise. Let me say that again. The U.S. economy is going to grow by $7 trillion over the next decade solely because of immigrants coming here to the U.S. Put another way, the amount the economy is projected to grow each year over the next five years alone is going to be higher than the previous 15 years in large part because of immigration. In fact, the economy is expected to grow faster than it has since before the Great Recession. And as the CBO puts it, quote, that faster growth of potential GDP stems mainly from the CBO's projection of a surge in net immigration, which increases the projected growth of the labor force. Speaking of the growth of the labor force, immigration is effectively saving our labor supply in this country. Look at this chart from the CBO report. So the orange line is the projected growth of people working in this country. So see how it keeps going up at a dramatic rate? Again, that is because of immigration. Because even as our population ages out of the labor force, more people retire, immigrants, most of whom are adults of working age, are coming in to fill the gaps. All of which is to say it's not a zero-sum game at all. It's not people that coming to take your piece of the pie for themselves. The pie itself is just getting bigger. We're making more stuff. There's more growth. To put it in raw numbers, the CBO projects the labor force in 2033, the amount of people working in this country and contributing to the economy, will be larger by more than 5 million people, mainly because of immigration. Again, more people working and paying taxes and into Social Security. It also means more people buying houses, more people building houses, as CBO notes. Quote, because immigrants tend to live with family or friends initially and form their own households gradually, high rates of immigration will continue to stimulate construction of new homes during the second half of the 2020s. Also worth noting, immigrants are more likely to start businesses than native-born Americans, yet another boon to economic growth. But you don't have to take my word for it or even the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Just listen to Donald Trump's handpicked chairman of the Federal Reserve. The U.S. economy has benefited from immigration and, and frankly, just in the last year, a, a, a big part of the story of the labor market coming back into better balance is immigration returning to levels that were more typical of the pre-pandemic era. The country needed the workers. It did. Right now, immigration, the border specifically, are arguably among the most dominant issues in all of American politics. It's why Republicans in the House impeached Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas last night by one vote. Well, that was really more of a political stunt than anything else. It was certainly the number one issue in yesterday's special election in New York's third congressional district. While it's true, migration has produced genuine stress on a whole bunch of social systems in cities across the U.S., including here in New York. I got to say, the consistent tenor of the rhetoric surrounding immigrants in this country is maddening. It, 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 there's this notion that is embedded in the conversation about people coming across the border uh, in right-wing media, though by no means exclusively, which basically posits that life in America is a zero-sum game, that, that, that there's only so much stuff, and then when you add more people, they come and take it. They're going to come take your stuff. And it's just wrong. In the most basic way, it completely fails to account for the obvious gift and bounty that is and has been immigration to the United States. The countless social and cultural benefits, sure, but just the sheer dollars and cents massive benefit to our economy. And so as we get closer and closer to November's election, you're going to hear politicians, perhaps even politicians of both parties, demonize migrants to score political points. But if you care about the growth of the U.S. economy and more deeply about the strength of our country as a whole, about the greatness of America, we should be grateful for our immigration rates and find ways to make paths into this great country more orderly, 
and humane. In the weeks ahead of last night's New York special election, polling made it clear many voters rate the border in that district as a top issue and that Republicans have a huge advantage on it. That is why you are seeing Republicans and Fox News continue to cover the issue. I mean, relentlessly doesn't even begin to describe it. But over the course of that New York campaign, Senate Democrats announced their work on a bipartisan immigration bill, one that Republican negotiator Senator James Lankford said was a strong conservative border bill. The Border Patrol Union even endorsed it, which was shocking. And then Donald Trump just killed it because he wants the border to be as chaotic as possible so that he can run on it. And he basically told everyone that. So the newest member of the New York congressional delegation, Tom Suozzi, turned it to an advantage in the special election. He spent a lot of time talking about the border, attacking his opponent for being against that bipartisan bill, and that strategy appears to have worked. Joining me now is Democratic Congresswoman Grace Meng, who represents New York's 6th District. That is right next to the western side of New York 3, encompassing much of northeastern Queens. Congresswoman Meng, it's great to have you. I saw this, um, this tweet of you uh, at the LIR Bayside stop handing out lit. Uh, I, I heard from people that were working on this campaign that you were tireless working on this election. Why were you, why did you think this race was so important? Well, this is a race that we knew was going to be a difficult campaign. This is a race that was the Republican Party's to lose. And so what we've seen is that we had a candidate who was someone who would finally be able to provide proper and deserved a representation for the constituents and the families of the 3rd Congressional District. And so myself, the labor unions, the women who write postcards, and underrepresented communities, we did everything we could to make sure that Tom Swazi would win this seat. Let's talk, show that. Show, I want to show that map again of, of the sixth district and the third district, um, because there's a little bit of Queens that, that borders your district that is in this district, and we saw very high performance by Swazi last night there. And and your district and parts of that district are, are have lots of immigrant communities, uh, folks from all over the world who've come here. Um, and, and I'm just curious how the politics of this question plays with those voters. That the message here has been look. Swazi pivoted to the right on immigration and it helped him get tough on the border. Don't let that issue be owned by Republicans. And from someone who represents a ton of immigrants from across the world, what is your read on that? So Tom really leaned in to talking and engaging with the voters of his district. He didn't shy away. He wasn't missing. He didn't hide. He wanted to do more debates. And he just got out there and talked to the people. When people feel like they are being heard, they want to support a candidate versus a candidate who was rarely seen anywhere publicly in the district. She wasn't even allowed to answer questions at her own press conferences. And so it's really important for voters that they have a candidate who is willing and ready to govern instead of just trying to uh, entertain the top of the ticket uh, or, you know, playing in Marjorie Taylor Greene's playpen and just spouting hateful and fearful rhetoric. Yeah, you you and, and you did a lot of you hosted him, I think, at a few events with with local media from uh a, a number of uh, in a number of different languages, things were translated into Chinese and Korean. Um, there was a dim sum event with Chinese Americans in, in the district. So at the same time, you have this messaging about the sort of border and migration. You've also got this outreach. Is there a tension between those two? This is why Tom was such a good candidate, because he was willing to meet voters where they are. Asian Americans made up about 18 to 20 percent of the electorate in Tom's district. So Tom went to multiple dim sum events, uh, Korean fried chicken events, visiting uh, South Asian business owners, houses of worship. He really met people where they were, and he talked to them about immigration. He talked to them about being willing to govern and being willing to reach across the aisle to fix things, to get the job done. There are people uh, inside the Democratic coalition who, uh, Chris Murphy, for instance, wrote this memo, uh, and it went out today basically saying, look, this is a blueprint 
that Democrats should learn a lesson from New York 3. We risk losing the 2024 election if we do not seize this opportunity to go on offense on the issue of the border. So that's one position, Chris Murphy, who I have a lot of respect for, frequent guests on the show. There are other folks, and particularly folks who are in the immigrant rights movement and other people I've talked to who are very worried that sort of reinforcing the kind of language Republicans have been using about migrants coming to a place like New York City is, is going to be bad politics and also put people in danger, that it, it sort of cultivates the worst instincts in people. What do you think? I think we can do it all. I think we can work together to look for a solution. Tom is someone who said that he's been willing to work across the aisle to uh, bring up a, a sensible and humane solution. But we also have to make sure to include the leaders and the people who are most impacted. We need to make sure that we're including our immigration rights activists and also members of our Congress, like the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Where do you think this goes now? You're, you're serving in a House that's now got... I mean, it, it, the House Republican Caucus has been the most dysfunctional that I've ever seen in, in my time covering. It, they just lost another vote. Like, what are they? What is going to happen next? <laughs> I, I just they, they have to bring things to the floor. The government's got to get funded. This, you know, Mike Johnson saying he wants a border bill now, even though they just ripped up one. Like, what does this tangibly mean? Tom Swazi's victory, the diminishment of that majority in terms of wh what this Congress looks like. I think that the Republican Party is in trouble. We now have, up to this point, four Republican chairmen of committees who are retiring from Congress. That's a big deal. That's about as big of a promotion as one can get in Congress. But they know that the speaker and the leadership is not governing, uh, is not working on behalf of the American people, but they are just trying to make Donald Trump happy and to make people like Marjorie Taylor Greene have more influence over Congress and American families. It is really wild, those, those four retirements, including some of the most powerful uh, committees that people spend a career waiting to be uh, uh, the chair of and just being like, I am I'm piecing out. Congresswoman Grace Meng, who represents uh, parts of Queens, was out there at those LIR stations early in the morning, pounding the pavement, uh, and has a part of this uh, big victory. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Thanks for having me. That does it for All In. You can catch us every weeknight at 8 o'clock on MSNBC. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash All In With Chris.